Thank you for joining us for The Drive Back, the movie podcast where we imitate our favorite thing to do after a movie, which of course is to talk about it on the ride home. I'm Garrett, and as always, I'm joined by my good friend and co-host, Adrian. Hey, I'm doing great. So am I. And today we have a show and tell. <laughs> Again, throw you off. Um, what is a show and tell, Adrian? Show and tell is where I've seen a movie and Garrett has not, so I show him that movie, and he has seen a movie, and I have not. And he shows me that movie, and then we review them back to back. That is absolutely right. And today, as seems to be the theme with show and tell, the movies have nothing in common. Uh, I'd also like to point out to all of our fan base that I usually pick the movie first. So the second movie picker always picks a very different movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's very true. (laughs) I guess I just like to throw a monkey wrench in it sometimes. But uh, all of this and more is coming up on The Drive Back. Alrighty, so back at it with the show and tell. This one, we're going to go ahead and just jump right in. Adrian, your pick is up first, since my uh, my pick was actually first on the last show and tell we did. Um, sure. So your choice was uh, The Signal, which was released in 2014. Uh, it was directed by William Eubank and stars Brenton Thwaites, Olivia Cook, and Bo Knapp. On a road trip, Nick and two friends are drawn into an isolated area by a computer genius. When everything suddenly goes dark, Nick regains consciousness only to find himself in a waking nightmare. So what made you pick uh, The Signal, Uh, besides the fact that I hadn't seen it? Yeah, uh, well, I saw it pretty recently, actually. Um, I got it confused as another movie called The Signal that I thought it was, which is a completely different concept. But um, I'm also a huge fan of this director, apparently. I think we found this out on a previous episode for Underwater. Mm-hmm. I believe, but uh, a lot of my favorite movies are made by this director, and I had no idea that they were all by the same person. So clearly, I like this guy's directing style and well, just how he approaches some films. So yeah, clearly, I uh, just thought it'd be interesting. You hadn't seen it, um, and I've seen it pretty recently, so I just thought it'd be a fun one. It was one of those rare movies where I hadn't even heard of it. And oh, you hadn't even heard of it? No, so I knew nothing. I didn't watch any trailers or anything. I went in completely oh, good. blind for this movie, which good. is very As rare when I do be. that. Yeah. Just because I'm usually so, like, knowledgeable of, like, the zeitgeist and, like, what movies are. This one I had no idea. Um, Good. And that makes me happy, actually. I feel like that was probably... It's much different to not know what's going to happen at all. Oh, yeah. Like, completely just not knowing anything. I mean, there's a lot in this movie that I wasn't expecting to happen. Um, but we'll get there in a moment. How fun! Okay, but, this is so cool. Uh, but let's go ahead and give some spoiler-free uh, thoughts before we dive into... Sure. Uh, our thoughts. Um, sure. So again, I had no idea anything about this movie. I hadn't seen it, hadn't heard of it. And um, I think it has a really interesting idea at its core. Um, you know, it's the, well, we'll go into spoilers later on, but there's a lot of different ideas they bring in to try and create one solid storyline. Um, however, I feel this movie's pretty boring. Oh. Um, it just, it, it didn't capture my attention as much as I was hoping it would. Um, this was the movie of um, the three that we're going to have to be re- you know, recording over the next couple of uh, days here. Um, the three uh, the three movies we watched. Um, it was the one I was looking forward to watching the most because I didn't know anything about it. And I kind of came out, not disappointed, but I think just like my expectations were like slightly under met, I would say. Interesting. But uh, what are your uh, general thoughts before diving in? I mean, obviously, like I said, I, I like this director. I think this is a really fun movie and... I think the reason I like this guy's movies so much is because they're always kind of a breath of fresh air to me. It kind of feels like that he always tries something new. Mm-hmm. Um, like with this, I feel like it kind of takes a lot of twists and turns that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Um, and then also like with Underwater, taking horror and placing it in a different kind of scenario completely. Yeah. Like he's just really good at that. So I really like this movie. Uh, I could totally see what you're saying about it maybe being a little boring, but I feel like if you go in with, like, this is just a normal movie with average expectations, mm. it's a fun film. Yeah, I mean, I, I to be fair, I went in with the average expectations because I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. 
Um, so, but let's go ahead and jump in because there is some spoilers for this movie. There's a lot that can, we can spoil uh, with this movie. Um, so let's go ahead and dive right in. If you do want to watch it, unfortunately, it is available to rent only. Um, so, you know, take that what you will and see what we think. Uh, if you agree with either one of us more than the other, then, you know, make your own decision. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and dive right in. First thing I want to point up, or first thing I want to bring up that was kind of the most, one of the more disappointing things for me, um, was the ending. Where he breaks through? Where he breaks through and... Like, he breaks through that glass or that screen or whatever it is, and then it looks like he's in a warehouse, just like an abandoned warehouse. Yeah. And then he keeps going towards it, and it's like, all of a sudden, there's just space, and then it's in a ship, like a big mothership-looking thing, but then there's an even bigger mothership-looking thing. Um, kind of, It was just kind of not what I was expecting the ending to be, I guess. Because I mean, they play with different things like alien abduction and like government conspiracies, and then there's like the enhanced body parts that everyone has, which they never really go over what Haley had. It's just like that spot on her back, so maybe it's something to do with her spine or something. Yeah, but um, but yeah, I mean, I, I feel like this the film is just a little too lofty. Like I feel like it's trying to be something super mind bending and. You know, like it's trying mm, to be something. That. It just doesn't reach that for me. I guess. I think. I think the ending is interesting. I think just the fact that it's not what you were expecting isn't bad. And I'm not saying that that's what you're saying either. Mm-hmm. But I'm saying like I really thought the twist was cool. That like this whole time you think he's breaking out, but then you realize that like he didn't even scratch the surface of what he's in, and yeah. it, it kind of just leaves it open. Like you got a little glimpse into this reality and. There's so much more going on. How many of these rooms exist? Like, what is? how many of these big ships exist? Like, it kind of just opened up the universe a lot, which I thought was really cool. And it kind of, again, played back into were we abducted by aliens? Mm-hmm. Probably. Yeah. Like, clearly. It, it's, it's also one of those things, too, that I want to bring up where I feel like the script gets a little confused sometimes. Mm. And it almost, like, tries to retcon things. So, at the beginning, like, obviously, it's... They're, they're being... They're attacked i guess by this hacker nomad and then when they're doing the interviews nomad is revealed to be an alien and then later on again that whole explanation changes where it's actually lawrence fishburne's character not an alien well i think lawrence fishburne is an alien no at the very end he takes off his thing he's a robot well that's yeah aliens it could be that's one and the same I, i i guess unless he like I don't know, but it, it just... Haven't you seen like... Lost in Space? He's a robot. <laughs> I actually haven't. No, I have not seen Lost in Space. Wow. Again, I don't watch TV shows a lot. Um, but, I don't know, it just kind of felt like convoluted. It also kind of just felt like they were going for too many things. Like, there was almost like that superpower element that they were going for. Like, the fist slam, getting all the shockwaves up. Human, yeah. And the speed, and... I think the reveal of the legs was really cool. Yeah. Um, I think I think I was I was disappointed by the fact that it was just another like they're in a simulation type thing or they're in a mothership. Like what I was thinking was they were abducted by aliens because there's an amazing sequence where they're running out of the house with the handicam in the beginning. Yeah. And Haley just goes like whoop, up into the sky. That was it's super cool. Crazy. Yeah. When I first saw the movie, I was like, what am I watching? This is insane. It yeah. almost felt like a chronicle the movie where, where the found footage movie where they get superpowers like just that kind of flying me- mechanic felt the same um but i loved the reveal of the legs that he didn't even know like we're finding out at the same time really really well done that was really cool and again it leads into my expectations that were kind of set during that moment like did so when he was abducted by aliens did they notice his legs weren't you know, up to the same capacity as others, and that's why his legs were replaced by this technology, yeah. and maybe the government's trying to understand the technology or whatever. It's It, it just kind of... I, I didn't know where it was going, and then where it ended up going was disappointing, I, I would say. I can definitely understand that. I can see that perspective, especially just going in blind for the first time. Um, but you also have to think, uh, to your point of it being just another kind of we're in a simulation, those movies weren't really out when this movie came out. 
So I mean, there's like the Matrix and things like that, but they're or not, like the basic not staples. Yeah, yeah, but I'm saying like so when this came out, I feel like now, especially in just the zeitgeist of pop culture, we're very much like we live in a real simulation. I think people really believe that to an extent now. Um, so I definitely think that when this came out, it had a lot more weight to that component of it. Like that reveal was much much bigger when this movie was initially released. E- Maybe, I don't know. I feel like I feel like simulation movies have been a thing for a while, so I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I mean, I have, probably have to do more research into that to figure out if there have been any kind of that's similar fair. kind of things. The other the other kind of weird issue I kind of had is that this movie kind of felt like a young adult fiction. It did, yeah. Which for for usually it's for better for worse. I would say for worse, in my opinion, a little bit. Some of the dialogue was a little hammy between the friends and. You know, there's, uh, like, you know, then all of a sudden the friends get superpowers kind of a thing. I don't know. It just kind of felt like, I don't want to say it felt like as bad as Twilight or anything like that. It, it's not. I would rather watch this movie a hundred times and watch Twilight again. But it just kind of felt in that same vein of stories, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it was, like, I, I think you're right. I think it had a lot of different kind of motifs and themes in there, like superpowers and mm. aliens, and and it did feel like a, a teen novel, like a like a young adult reader's action book. Yeah. Um, and uh, But again, though, I thought the CGI was pretty good for most of it. I thought the display of superpower was cool. I did think... That the ground smash, like all the slow motion that started to happen towards the end, did feel like somebody on the crew figured out how to do really good slow motion. (laughs) Then they were like, they're like, but we're already filmed 90% of the movie. He's like, then I'm going to put it all in this last 10 minutes. After effects. (laughs) (laughs) But I, I always point that out when it's like they kind of really honed in on one feature of the film towards the end, and it was that slow motion camera. They definitely leaned really heavy on that. Yeah, I, I definitely, I, I, I can definitely agree with that. But I do want to jump into some positives, um, because I don't want to seem like I'm all negative on this movie because I'm not. I mean, like this movie has some some really good elements of it. Um, I mean, the the three teen actors or not teen actors, the three like college kid actors, mm-hmm. they all did their job pretty well. Um, I mean, usually I'm not a big fan of Brenton Thwaites. But he was he did decent good. here. Yeah. Um, Olivia Cook was very good. Um, I think Bo Knapp is the other uh, actor who played yeah. the, the other hacker. He was he was all right for what he did. Um, so I mean, that, nothing was kind of bad there. I would say Lawrence Fishburne was great. Just kind of playing that kind of you don't know if he's on their side or not kind of role. And playing both really well. Like, yeah. friend, but scary and really, really good. And kind of the same character as a rival. Not really. I would okay. say Arrival had more, like, now, looking back on the signal now, he plays a machine well in the movie. Yeah. And I look at some of those responses and the lack of emotion in his kind of answers. When the when the chair hits the... the Zero window, response. No yeah. response. So, like, now it kind of all clicks. You're like, okay, he's actually a machine. But um, I think in, in Arrival, he's more of just like your military kind of kind of guy. Yeah. Um, but one of the other things that I want to talk about too is I don't think this movie had the biggest of budgets. No. And, it, and they never do. Even Underwater was like the first big budget one. Yeah. This movie utilizes budget very well. Like the fact yeah. that most of the movie, while it may be boring, takes most of it takes place in that underground facility. So you reuse the same, same rooms room. and yeah. you know, you can film this all in a couple of days as opposed to a month. So yeah. it, it makes it a lot easier. So and then even was, when they did, even when they break out, right, that's just in like a desert town kind of thing. Yeah. So like that's super easy to film anywhere and all in one day. Like you, it, they definitely use their money well. Exactly. Yeah. It, and it shows. And there is also in that with, with the budget, I mean, the visual effects for the budget are very good. Yeah. Um, the legs are very believable. On uh, Brenton, um, there is one shot where he starts standing up when he's at the border crossing type thing, where the legs and like the oh, cloth yeah. moving over the legs look kind of bad. <laughs> but but like, it like the legs never clip through his body. Like it's never no. not not believable. Like it's yeah, very well it looks done. good. Um, and yeah. the design is very interesting too. I would say. Yeah. Um, I would say the gauntlets that 
Bo's character wears are kind of easy generic looking but yeah the legs were definitely like the thing that they they specialize those visual effects on and then the reveal of, you know lawrence fishburne at the end when he kind of turns his head and it's all you know wires and like hollow it's just like a face kind of curved really really cool um and i so, i like that this movie took turns like that like for, especially for you watching it not knowing what's going to happen i feel like those reveals were probably pretty fun like being like oh like now i now it all makes sense yeah, like, I he's think, been this the whole time. I think the twists, the twists and reveals, just started happening a little too late into the movie. I would have, I would have preferred some of them to happen earlier. Yeah. Sure, because I would definitely say, like the first forty-five to fifty minutes, I was kind of like, okay, let's let's get this going. But then the last like forty-five, fifty minutes, I would say were, you know, it was pretty, it was faster paced, definitely. It was Absolutely. Little, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, absolutely, though, you already mentioned it, but, but f- by far my favorite scene in the movie is, I guess, too, is the superpower running at the end. thought that was really cool and, like, breaking out. Um, but the scene where she gets picked up and abducted is nuts. It feels like that could be out of paranormal activity. And the way it's done is so creepy. It's not like she's just picked up off the ground. It's like she's yanked off Yink. this planet. <laughs> and, like, zero control. It's, like, dark out. I mean... And the reaction in the handheld camera feels so real. If you actually saw that, mm-hmm. you would just crap yourself. <laughs> like, yeah. You it, it's like, crazy. I will say also, though, I think for most of this, for like, when I, my initial expectations, I thought this was going to be more of something like the movie Ex Machina, mm-hmm. where, like, the, the hacker gets them in and then starts Interesting. torturing yeah. them, kind of a thing. But then as soon as they were, like, hearing noises and then she gets yoinked up into the sky, I was like, are they really going the alien route? Okay, let's see how this works. And then they show the alien in the footage, which uh-huh. you don't know if that's real or not. Yeah. I mean, it probably is for the sake of the movie, but um, it was just very, very interesting. Um, I do want to hear more about though what uh, like you know, like what your some more of what you thought of the movie. Like what do you like what like because you're you're a sci-fi guy, I would say. I am. It's yeah. probably your favorite genre. So like you know yeah. that this is full out sci-fi. How does this stack up against other sci-fi films that you call your favorites? Well, it's better than Endgame, I'll tell you, or uh, Ender's Game, I'll tell you that I much. was going to say, Adrian, we're going to have to shut this <laughs> podcast off right now. <laughs> I think the signal is better than Endgame, hot take. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, no, I mean, that's really tough, because I feel like a lot of my favorite sci-fi movies, most of them are the big budget genre-changing ones, like Interstellar, um, or like The Martian, like any, they're, they're all the big ones. Um, and the books have all been really good as well, but I would say that this is one of my favorite low-budget sci-fi. And again, my, one of my other favorite ones, Love, is also by this director. Yeah. Um, another low-budget sci-fi film about human connection and being lonely. Um, so I would say it stacks up pretty well. Again, I, I'm all for like pushing your own vision, and I feel like every movie this guy puts out, you can tell it's he had a vision for what he wanted to make. Mm-hmm. And the movie comes out that way. And whether you like it or not, that's up for interpretation. But yeah. he, he, it does not feel corporate. It does not feel bought. It feels like a, an art piece whenever you watch one of his movies. Like somebody, you can tell somebody crafted this thing. There's passion. Um, yeah, and there's a passion. And yeah, again, whether you like it or not, up to you. But I appreciate it and stack it up there pretty highly. Um, just in terms of, I guess, ones that I like. I wouldn't say that I like love it or anything. But I would recommend it to someone. Um, so I'd say it's pretty high just because you can tell that somebody made this thing for us and that's really cool. Gotcha. I think one of the other compliments I could really pay it is that it feels like an indie director trying to make his version of a big budget Hollywood film on an indie budget through an indie studio. Yeah. Like and I feel was, like every this is shot his biggest film until underwater. Yeah, it was big it's bigger than love. So yeah, this is probably like his middle point of like, hey, I can kind of do big budget stuff. If you give me the money, exactly. Um, and I, but I just like that every shot in this whole movie, you can see the personality, you can see the the care that was taken. It does. It's like a big indie movie, and I find that really, really heartwarming and really fun to watch and refreshing. So I would definitely recommend it to anybody that's like just looking for maybe not like yeah, you're probably tired of all the big budget sci-fi movies because yeah. nowadays they're all kind of or something new that you don't know. Maybe you didn't know it existed. Yeah. <laughs> Or, yeah, maybe didn't know it existed, but also that's, like, definitely not a mainstream movie. This is definitely one that is, like, kind of off-Broadway, 
per se for sci-fi, um, but still very much worth checking out. I think the other big comparison we can make too is that this was released in 2014. If this was released today, it would be a Netflix film. That's a really good, yes, absolutely. And it would probably be one of the better ones, to be honest. I feel like people would be like, but I think it's very similar to that Chris Pratt movie that he just did on Netflix. Uh, yeah. That was Feels, Prime, but yeah. But Prime, but very much like that feel. Or like that Mother it. movie that came out. With the robot that's taking care of the baby. Like, oh, so, like, yeah. Those, those kind of higher concept, but like not big budget studio sci-fi films. That come I definitely... Netflix. Yeah, but I definitely yeah. think this would be a movie that if it came out on Netflix, it'd be the ones that it would circulate through the friend group. People would be like, oh, did you check out The Signal on Netflix? Like, the featured movie. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Like that, It's definitely that good of a movie. It's not like going to sell out an amphitheater or anything, but yeah. it's a good movie. Yeah, exactly. Um, but let's go ahead and uh, drop some final thoughts and some scores before we dive into our second movie today. Um, since this was my first time watching, I'll go ahead and share my thoughts first. Um, so as far as my final thoughts, I said that while it has an interesting premise and it has a solid use of a small budget, I felt the film gets a little too boring during the middle. You almost lose your attention. Um, and I thought the ending was a little subpar, but it's definitely something that's different and I can tell that there's passion behind it, um, which always helps me enjoy and appreciate a film more. Um, that being said, I still did give it a 55. Um, I don't think it's the strongest sci-fi movie in the world, but I feel like it could have been a lot lower um, with, how, yeah. with how much my attention was lost kind of during the initial 45 minutes. Fair enough. Yeah, that's kind of right, right down the middle. Um, I'm still not quite clear on how my scale works <laughs> because I feel like it's just more personal preference-based. Um, but I gave this movie uh, an 82. I just feel like it's that's kind of middle of the road for me. It's like good. I would definitely recommend it to you. Um, like we said, if you're looking for that kind of movie to scratch that itch of sci-fi with a little bit of action, 100%. This would be near the top of my recommendations for that kind of movie, um, especially yeah, like a Netflix night in kind of thing. It's a good one. Abs excuse me, absolutely. Um, but let's go ahead. We're gonna change gears. We're gonna change literally. Why are you talking about the scene already? Literally changing huh? gears and. <laughs> Almost in like literally almost a hundred years difference. Um, yeah. we're gonna, the second movie that I recommended for Adrian to watch was Modern Times, um, which oddly, which conflicting with its title was released in 1936. Um, it was directed by Charlie Chaplin and stars Charlie Chaplin, Paulette Goddard, and Henry Bergman. The Tramp, the famous character portrayed by Charlie Chaplin, uh, struggles to live in a modern industrial society with the help of a young homeless woman. Uh, it is worth it to note that Modern Times is the 39th highest rated film of all time on IMDb. Because um, it's just, you know, it's a classic Charlie Chaplin film, so usually it's going to be rating pretty high on any list. Um, yeah, it's got a lot of skewed bias just based off its uh, prestige as well, I'd say. Definitely. There, there are a lot of films, you know, and, and I feel like it's, it's something we should address as critics, right? Like you do there is kind of a sense of going into a movie like this that you kind of have to rate it higher sometimes but you should just be honest and not me give your feelings um uh, but adrian this was uh, well actually i guess first um i guess like similar to apocalypse now and films like that i recommended this movie because it is on the top you know lists of kind of everyone out there uh it's a charlie sure. chaplin film we haven't watched a charlie chaplin film no. on the podcast we, yet we haven't watched a silent film um it's not completely silent but we'll get there what we, we will get there, because uh, okay. that's one of the cooler parts of the movie, I think. Um, but uh, So that's why I recommended it. Uh, what, so what were your thoughts coming out of it? I, had you ever seen a Charlie Chaplin film before? No, and that was actually my first kind of big point, is I didn't realize, I figured it out while watching, but that whenever I thought ab about like seeing Charlie Chaplin in my head, I was actually picturing the tramp. Yeah, I didn't realize that that was a character. I just thought that's who Charlie Chaplin was. Mm -hmm. um, so to kind of figure that out was really, really interesting. This is the first movie I've ever seen of Charlie Chaplin's. Um, but also, like conversely, I feel like even though this is a an older film, like you said, like a hundred years, I feel like it holds up super well. Yeah, like it's kind of unbelievable how not old it feels mm -hmm. like it almost feels like you could if someone if like an artist was like oh i'm gonna make a old type movie now with all those tropes this is the movie that would be made now it's yeah. it's pretty amazing it was pretty incredible to see 
All right. Uh, so as far as my uh, general thoughts before spoilers, um, I think this movie is fantastic. I think that it, it its political message, its kind of human message, is something that this movie is still relevant today, I would say. Yeah. Um, pretty hardcore. Um, there is an incredible shot in the first 30 seconds of sheep being herded through the fences, and then it, it cuts, to, like match cuts, to people coming off of the subway, which is just ingenious. Um, but, um, I mean... Is it necessarily the most, like, engaging film in the world? Maybe not. There's 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 a couple of moments where it can, you can lose your attention, especially if you're among the newer, you know, generations. Um, but there is definitely there's there's skill, there's craft there, there's some incredible practical effects, um, and but, some good stunt work. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, but let's go ahead and dive into this uh, with spoilers. Um, Modern Times is able to watch on HBO Max if you have a subscription, so you can watch it there. Um, so, diving right in, Adrian, what, what, give me give me some thoughts here. What's what's your uh, what's your you're unhinged? What can you say about the movie without any spoilers? Um, so, I, spoilers? yeah, I, with spoilers, I really liked the commentary. Uh, I thought this movie did a really good job of not attacking any one thing in particular, but attacking just the entire system basically but then also saying like but the system is right and it's mad at these people like it just was full circle the whole time Mm -hmm. um so i really like that i liked a lot of the the timing of charlie chaplin's physical comedy um a lot of it is really spot on and unrivaled today Mm -hmm. um i also looked up a lot afterwards because again this was my first charlie chaplin movie so i definitely did some research afterwards this was literally like the last silent film, like Among the last, ever. Yeah, yeah, and and it was because Charlie Chaplin specifically knew he could not be rivaled in like the silent film genre, so he released one more movie with the Tramp. Um, and then also, biggest spoiler, um, and I had to look this up afterwards, but this is the first time that the Tramp speaks in a movie. Yes. Yeah. So there was like a ton of hype around like what is he gonna sound like? What is what's he gonna say? But Charlie Chaplin did the most amazing thing. He made a song with multiple languages in it that says nothing. And it's just gibberish. Yeah. And so it's like it's still such a universal character. Like that doesn't define anything. He doesn't take a stance. He tells a story while singing, and you can clearly follow what he's singing about. But like the actual, you don't actually hear him. It's it's just nonsensical. And I just thought the genius of someone to think of that, right? The hype, like he knew it, he could never live up to it. So he said, "I'll just subvert everyone's expectations and just go wild with it." Yeah. Um, I thought all that was super fun. I mean, I could go on and on. I feel like a lot of the scenes in this movie were fantastic. Like the scene where he falls into the gears and he's like snaking through it. That's a real set. Like yeah. that was they. That's crazy. Nowadays, that would all be CGI. But it was like, it was super cool to see a physical actor, like, doing, not, like, insane stunts, but just doing his job. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, you have to climb in there and act like you're getting sucked through gears. Mm-hmm. Okay, here I go. <laughs> or also the, but, yeah, the incredible, great. like, the feeding machine. Just, like, the, the humor with that is just... Is and then great. I love that when he's on the line and he's got to tighten the, the bolts... And then he keeps, like, getting distracted and having to go back, and he's trying to, like, catch up. Um, just a lot or of, like yeah, the, the really good where he stuff. just keeps doing the, like, to everything. Like, he has to keep doing it. <laughs> is, is great. Also, the I guess the commentary, but also the humor of the fact that he helps to take out the uh, prisoners at the jail who are, like, who are, like, trying to get cocaine in. Yeah, and but if he's the only reason he's able to do anything is because he accidentally got <laughs> the cocaine. <laughs> it's just oh, it's just great. Well, and this movie does such a good job of yeah, he's he's kind of a a doofus character, but everything he does, like all these scenarios, are by accident. Like it's so his character that it just like it flows so easily from one situation to the next, or like. Everything he touches breaks. He he's yeah. good natured. He's good hearted. He wants good things to happen, but he just can't. He breaks every single thing mm-hmm. that he seems to touch. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just I thought it was really cool. I, I thought that I loved that he's trying to 
to kind of get the ideal life in that really funny scene where they're actually in the dream house and he's got like the orange tree or whatever right outside. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, I think it's so cool because it's like that's the American dream, and even way back then, people were making movies about how that's not possible anymore. Yeah, and that that's not real anymore. You can't have that, and I think that holds true today. Mm-hmm. That's what I mean when if you made this movie now, all the same themes would hold up a hundred percent. Yeah, it just would be more of a drama. There wouldn't be as much comedy in it. It would be like an Oscar type film and not, you know, slapstick which is a shame. Mixed, which, you know, commentary. So definitely Which is a shame because I think the comedy is what allows the message to sink in so subtly. Mm-hmm. Like you're kinda of, you're laughing, but then you're also like, Oh, that's how I feel at my job. <laughs> and then, and then you're like, Oh boy. That's <laughs> wow. Oh boy. <laughs> um, also, I want to talk about one sequence that is still to this day, if you don't know how it was done, is incredible. And it's the sequence when they're in the uh, the shopping or the department store and they're up on the toy floor. And Charlie Chapman is on the roller skates and he's getting perilously close to yeah. an edge. That, well, first off, no department store has an edge like that with no yeah. fence. <laughs> but. And he's also um, really bad at it. Like, he can't blindfold. stand up at up. Yeah, he can't stand up at all. But do you know... Because he gets really close to the edge. Do you know how... Is it a, well, let me ask you this. I don't, but was it a real edge? Yes. Yes. Oh, here's my idea. I think that this they... Is, this is our version of Corridor Crew. Uh, yeah. VFX Artists React. Uh, how I do you think, think they did it? I think that they had some type of very thin fishing wire that was a perfect length so that when he was tugging on it, he knew that he was right at the end, but it wouldn't, it wasn't like super strong, but it was just enough of a pull. So he would know like, okay, I got to go the other way. Oh, it was like, like to like, like, like tied to the wall. So it's like the perfect length. So like, Hey, so you if can't he, go if, past he, if he rubs up against it, like, okay, I need to turn or like, like, if, if, like if, if it's pulling, right. If it's pulling on his belt a little bit, that means, He's getting really close to the end, so he would go, oh, I need to go back towards the pole. Like, I'm near the edge, so let me go back. No. Okay, fair enough, but also not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. (laughs) For a low-budget practical. So Let me think. Do you think I can get it if I really... um, If you're not familiar with the practices of the 30s kind of earlier film, you may not. Um, But as soon as I say it, you're going to like, it's going to snap on your head like a light bulb. Was there a mirror? No. Ah, okay, tell me. So there is an edge, but it's probably about an inch. Okay. And everything else, so all the when you see down into the mall or whatever, you, I think up onto the wall too is all a matte painting. Oh, they painted it. And wow. I actually, I, that's so I know that for sure. The only thing I'm not too sure on is he's he's skating backwards a lot of the time. I think the footage was reversed. Hmm. I, there's a piece of me it that didn't thinks, feel reversed. Though. I'd have to I'd have to double check it, but there was there were yeah. parts that felt like it was reversed. I also hmm. feel I also feel like, and I don't know for sure that he could see through the blindfold, or at least I'm had sure to rehearse it yeah, so it's, much. Yeah, but yeah, there, well, he, there, again, being a master of his craft, I I would guarantee that that was a very planned shot from beginning to end, like exact placement and everything. I'm actually going to look up the skating scene to see how they did it. Uh, just to, just because I want to make sure that I'm correct here. Um, this will be fun for all of our non-visual listeners. Uh, so, it was... Yeah, it doesn't actually show Chapman in any danger. He performs on a fully floored set with a ledge to help him discern when to stop. Since it was measured exactly... Um, it was, yeah, so it was about an inch and there was a matte painting would appear to be the precise precise size of the gap without interfering with his performance. So I was right. Um, he cruises around blindfold. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, it, that's exactly what I said. Um, it's, so it is the full set. It's just the down part, the ledge. Yeah. It is a matte painting on a piece of glass in front of the camera. So it's actually in camera. It's not yeah. added later. And, he, and he's just performing the routine. And that's why the camera moves. Because it's on that glass and it's precisely... Lined up to be perfect. Which is just incredible. Uh, for the time. It's actually it's groundbreaking for the time. It's kind of like 
it was it's I know it's Chaplin, but it was considered to be kind of like the Matrix of its time, where it set Pushed a precedent visual. for visual effects. I think your uh, microphone is messing with your camera there. It likes know. the little guy on it. I don't know. Let's go. There, there we go. We got you. Um, but um, but yeah. So anything else you want to talk about with uh, Modern Times for the first time viewer? Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean. Not really. I feel like it's been reviewed to death for sure. Yeah. Um, but the final scene was pretty cool. I did want to talk about the use of voices. I yes, thought it was very interesting that. that it's a silent film. It still uses talking cards and all that stuff. But whenever there, it does have sound, but whenever someone is talking, it's coming from a machine. Yes. Um, and you can definitely tell that Charlie Chaplin felt that, uh, like, using voices and because talking pictures were not new at this point right like they had been around mm -hmm. i think this so was like right near like right during the advent yeah yeah so i feel like they were definitely calm they were becoming commonplace so this was still unusual to have a silent film but i feel like you could tell that charlie chaplin felt like that wasn't needed mm -hmm. um and the times that it's used is again from a robot and it's almost like yeah this is just a gimmick like this is a joke like i'm using this as a joke I didn't almost. I didn't so much get that. And actually, I, this is my interpretation. Maybe let's see if you subscribe to it or not. Um, the only voice you hear throughout most of the entire movie is the boss of the plane. The screen and it comes through yeah. the screen, and you can use. You can say, "Oh, it was technology. That's why they they did it for multiple reasons." For me, it kind of came from the idea that it was someone of power, someone who was in control, and had their voice coming through. And the only other person's voice you hear in the entire movie is. Charlie Chaplin's when he's singing at the end because he's now in control because he's yeah. making up the words as he goes along and he's kind of taking advantage of people around him because like they don't know what he's saying he could say whatever the hell he wants yeah but he's in control like it's the first time he's really in like he's in that kind of powerful position that's that's, that's interesting what I read into it as that's super fascinating and actually I would also just make that a credit to this movie that I think a lot of the messages can be interpreted differently. Like, there's a lot of mm. anti-Big Brother stuff. There's a lot of anti-Union stuff. There's a lot of anti-government stuff. But, like, how you interpret those messages, I guarantee you, will be different from person to person. And they're done so purposefully in that way that, yeah, this is a little vague. Like, it's definitely a pointed attack. But it's done in a way that you can decide... It basically aligns with everybody. Yeah. It's just a universal film that is funny and has great messages throughout. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the, it, it is, it, I would say it's a timeless movie. Because, like, again, not only because of its message, but the, everything kind of holds up with it. I also say you could show it to kids. I feel like it's, kids yeah. would find it very funny. It's very slapstick, like people falling down. I would comedy. say middle school, high school would probably be like the best age to show this, just because you can also talk about the greater themes involved and then they can have an appreciation for it i mean you, you can yeah, tell this to I, younger but i'm talking about like you know like like in a classroom I understand setting or something. It, yeah i'm just talking about like if you put it on for your kids i feel like they'd be entertained i i'd be entertained it's just oh. a lot of that like when when everyone goes through that, that phase of like uh people falling people getting pushed people getting stuck that's like this type of humor it's all that slapstick stuff so i think it's a look at i also really like the final scene of the film um where they are like they decide that modern times are not for them mm -hmm. um and they go off and i really thought it was neat that the last talking card i forget what it said uh like don't fear we sh we sh shall go on or whatever Something like uh, um but i just thought it was cool especially when i looked up afterwards that this is the final like movie of its era yeah. That the final thing said in the movie by Charlie Chaplin is like, hey, don't worry about the future. We'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. Just a super, super cool dude. What and a then, homie. And then his best performance came after this. So, yeah. Which was <laughs> the, great, so the great cool dictator. Figure it. So, um, but, also, uh, I just want to say that I, uh, side note, if you've made it this far on the podcast, um, Charlie Chaplin looks exactly like Edgar Allan Poe in my head. <laughs> and that's all. There you go. And it was also played beautifully by Robert Downey Jr. in a uh, film called... Uh, I forget what it was called. I think it was called Chaplin, maybe? I don't know. But uh, he did, it was a biopic about Charlie Chaplin. And, uh, oh, I didn't know Robert that. Robert Downey Jr. played him. Yeah, he was Oscar-nominated, actually. 
Wow. So, but uh, let's go ahead and get in some final thoughts for uh, in some scores for Modern Times. Adrian, as a first time viewer, um, what were some thoughts and what was your score? Sure. Final thoughts. Uh, great movie. Holds up to this day. Uh, still pretty funny. Uh, a lot of good comedy. A lot of good comedic timing. Um, just all around a very well rounded person uh, doing it and a master of their craft doing it um, and directing it. Uh, and yeah, just uh, really, really good. Um, I gave this movie a 96. Um, right. I think it holds up super well. I would definitely show this to someone if they were looking for something new and interesting. Gotcha. Uh, I'm really close to you. I actually ended up giving it a 95. Um, Whoa. It is a very strong movie. I think there's a couple of points during uh, the film where it kind of like rests on its laurels, I guess is a way of saying it. It kind of, you know, it perhaps could have been shorter during the time movies weren't like long, but they also weren't short either. So there, I feel like there's a couple sequences that maybe could have been cut out. Sure. Um, but uh, I mean, the the effects still hold up to this day, especially with the matte painting of the you know the store, um, the symbolism and the kind of themes at play are always great. And just the idea of like you know beauty and happiness in the face of tragedy and sadness is yeah. just, it's just always great. I mean, he and he and the the homeless girl. You know, they, they find happiness in that shack they find out in the boonies. So, oh my gosh, when he falls through the door, it's just, great. yeah, it's just such good, like, yeah. <laughs> comedy. So, but um, yeah, so that's going to bring us to an end for this episode of The Drive Back. Um, next week, we've got our special holiday episode. We'll be taking Woo! a look. Kind of similar to what we did for our Halloween episode. We're taking a look at one of the movies of the holiday season um, that was randomly picked by us just because it sounded like it would be interesting to cover. So we'll see if it's good. Um, it's, it's so good, in fact, and we're so excited to record that we may not even change clothes. We may just use, wear the same clothes next week. Yeah, I'm feeling real good vibes, but, you know, maybe we'll not. See. We'll see. But uh, anyhow, Adrian, if any of our listeners or viewers... If they haven't done so already, where can they find us online? The Drive Back Podcast everywhere. Talk to us on Instagram. Follow us on your favorite podcasting apps, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, whatever the good one is. Uh, and then here on YouTube, um, go ahead and subscribe to us. Hit the like button and then hit the bell. Uh, on all platforms, we post every Monday. We have a new episode. So that's 52 episodes a week, which means we watch like 100 to 200 movies a year, which seems crazy when you say it like that. But yeah. uh we definitely are a good resource of quantity of movies if you're looking for yes. what we've seen. <laughs> and quality of recommendation. I'm going to go ahead yeah. and say that, too. I would, I would agree. I feel like uh, people definitely, if I say a movie's good, they'll check it out for the most part. Um, and if I say it's not, then people don't. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how reviews work. <laughs> Well, that's going to be an end for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. We love you guys so much. We will see you next time on The Drive Back. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Drive Back. Make sure to be on the lookout for new episodes every Monday, and make sure to follow us on social media.